make a brief summary of the things we are practicing basically you know, and, uh, since it is a very wide subject you know. just to make a brief summary then at the end I will go into a very specific sutta which is the Kalama Sutta which you all know of course you know, which is really interesting and quite quite well known for a reason you know. so we are here in a Buddhist center actually you know. and as we've seen we are not talking about you know any kind of Buddhism but we are dealing with uh, basically this tradition which is the Theravada tradition and the Burmese lineage of Mahasi Sayadaw hmm? and um, we all know that Buddhism is a very wide phenomena hmm? but anything and everything I will say is based on the canonical suttas hmm? which are the discourses of the Buddha hmm? which he gave a long time ago 2600 years ago that's quite a while ago <laughs> and how do we know that actually the Buddha said those things well we will never know for sure <laughs> that's the truth of it but we have very different sources which are in the Pali language in Chinese in Tibetan in Sanskrit and what's what is quite reassuring or interesting anyway that all these sources uh, say just about the same things so as we all know in any kind of subject that we study we get different sources if the different sources say just about the same thing they are quite reliable and we can be pretty sure that okay maybe he actually spoke those words and <laughs> taught those things that's as far as we can go hmm? because as we all know the, the, all, all the teaching was an oral, oral tradition basically the Buddha didn't write anything we actually we did actually we do not know whether he could read or write hmm? because in those times you know it was I mean it was a quite a well-off person, a prince or something like that, he didn't need to know how to read or write, basically. Mm -hmm. So the teaching was given during talks, the yogis would listen and learn by heart the talk. So they could teach it again to their pupils, basically. Mm -hmm. That's the way... Maybe, but that's not sure from a historic point of view, three to six months after the Buddha's not that but Parinibbana you know, there was the first council where all these fully awakened pupils they had to be arahant to go to that council otherwise they wouldn't take them you know. they just recited in the whole all the suttas of the Buddha which were then taken as canonical teachings and they were passed on from generation to generation actually that's as far as we can go so a long time ago anyway what's really important about these things is that in these suttas we find uh, the why, the how, the when uh, of the practice that's our own interest basically and um, the Buddha in a way is very clear about his own teaching. I teach one thing and one thing only, Dukkha Dukkha Niroda. I mean, I just teach suffering and the end of suffering. Please don't ask me anything else because I, I'm not interested. <laughs> it was very, very concise, <laughs> anyway. And um, another well, first of all, we know that Buddha is just a title given to somebody who has seen 
or has realized the truth. So the Buddha, first of all, has had an experience firsthand. He does, doesn't just talk because of hearsay or no, no. He's, he's really had a real experience, and then he spends his life teaching other people about that experience. But in this tradition, the Buddha doesn't have really the power to enlighten anybody else. He can just teach the way, and then through our own practices we can get enlightened. That's we have to do the work. <laughs> That's the thing, you know. Other traditions have different views about these things, which are totally okay by me. But in this particular tradition, no. The role of the Buddha is the role of a teacher. He will show you the way you have to walk the path. By walking the path shown by the Buddha and all the Buddhas that came before him, you gain realization, freedom from suffering, which is not a bad idea, in my own estimation. And um, you gain realization or freedom from suffering by seeing clearly in what is called the Dhamma. Hmm? You know, the word Dhamma has got very different meanings. You know? The Dhamma that we are talking about here is that universal law of the universe. Truth. Hmm? That's the Dhamma. Hmm? And by seeing deeply and clearly into the Dhamma, one frees himself from, or herself, from the samsaric suffering hmm? existence, basically. Hmm. What is this universal law of the Dhamma? You already know, but I'm going to tell you again. It's that all conditioned things are impermanent. That's this universal truth and bear in mind that is besides the fact that a Buddha appears and proclaims it. It is independent of a Buddha, of the coming of a Buddha. The law of the Dhamma just is. It's an eternal law, always there to be discovered. Hmm? So the Buddha just shows the way to the deep realization of the Dhamma. How do we do that? Mm. By following the teaching of the Buddha, which, to keep it really concise, consists of a, not just meditation, because the word in Pali is bhavana. Mm. Bhavana is usually roughly translated as meditation, but actually it's not correct. We could translate it as inner training, mental training. Meditation is part of it, but not just meditation. For example, we know that there is this part about morality or ethical conduct, which is a sila, hmm? keeping the precepts. Hmm? That's the basis of the practice. Not so popular in the West, but anyway, <laughs> that's the basis, you know. Because the practice of sila or morality creates an inner and outer environment of safety. Well, usually here in the retreat center we feel quite safe because by keeping the precepts each and ev every yogi actually is creating by his own behavior this safe place. I don't have to watch my back. <laughs> You know, people are not going to steal things from me. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> they are, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So that's the basis in that, uh, let's call it safe place, the practice of meditation can take place. Mm -hmm. So the mind, which is usually very unstable and 
basically poisoned by the three poisons, which are greed, anger and delusion. In this safe place the mind has got a chance to cool down and slowly, slowly we get more and more quiet. The image which is usually used that of a lake or some sort of water which is very unstable usually and murky with mud. But if you just let it be by itself, it will be, you know, clearer and clearer and clearer because all the mud will fall to the bottom of of the lake or a pond or whatever, you know. And uh, thanks to that quiet, which is basically samatha, the practice of insight can take place because the water is clearer, you can see deeper and in a much clearer way. Hmm? And that is the development of uh, basically insight and wisdom, which is ultimately what frees us. But it's not really correct, because it's all these things together which make possible you know, the, the arising of wisdom, actually. You, know? you can't have one without the other. You know, it's, uh, we would really love to you know, just sit 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night and that's it. We get enlightened. Mm. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> we never know. Huh? It's just causes and conditions coming together. We have no idea whatsoever. We really have no idea. We know very, very little. We, don't, do not, we do not know that much about this stuff. But, it's, uh, but we have to show up to the practice, yes. Otherwise, we are sure that nothing will happen. Uh, I just yesterday I was talking about going to the pond to fish and that sort of stuff. You know, that, that's a nice image to me. You, know, it's, you have to show up. You know, if you want to catch a fish, you have to go fishing. You know, uh, the fact that you go fishing doesn't really you know, make you sure that you will catch a, f- catch a fish. But if you do not go, you are totally sure that you will not get a fish. You know, it's pretty sure. So that's about it, you know. Mm. So the Dhamma, this universal law, which is all conditioned phenomena are impermanent. By seeing deeply into this eternal law, we gain realization or freedom from suffering. How do we do that? We've just seen that, you know. We need sila, we need practice, we need uh, insight, development of wisdom, all these nice things that come together as causes and conditions. And then, when the time is right, practice comes to a level of fruition, there's a fruition of the path. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. In this tradition, the liberation is seen as a process with different levels to it. So we basically free ourselves from greed, anger and delusion in different stages, at different depths, we could say. You know? Which is another good news to me. It's not all or nothing, but you can be, you know, a bit better. Why not? (laughs) You practice a little bit, you get a little bit of benefit. Usually, you know, again in the uh, Thai tradition, again, I think Achencha, you let go a little bit, you gain a little bit. You let go a little bit more, a bit more freedom. Let go everything, go on to the other shore. (laughs) It's true, (laughs) basically it's true. But this I, me, mind is not really convinced, you know. uh, Hold on to it, you know, as tight as you can, for as long as you can. Yes, of course. Why? Because we are ignorant. We are very confused about the real nature of things, you know, it's... Uh, the Dhamma is not really clear to us, you know, that this... 
all conditioned phenomena are impermanent. <laughs> well, maybe, but, you know, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Got more important things to do. <laughs> I me mine, I me mine, I me mine, all the time, all the time, all the time. This. Uh, but anyway, so those are, were a few points which might be interesting and useful to keep in mind. Mm? And uh, now I want to come tonight to this particular sutta, which is the Kalama Sutta, which is really exemplary in a way about this sort of teaching. You probably already know this thing by heart. Rather. Bear with me and be patient. I'm going to expound on it a little bit. Once upon a time, there was this, you know, clan of people called the Kalamas. And they were, well, first of all, they were not disciples of the Buddha. They were just regular people in a village. Imagine that, you know. And the Buddha happened to be traveling in that part of India. Hmm? And it seems like he already had a quite a reputation. I mean, the Buddha. Hmm? And so the Kalama thought, you know, let's ask him. You know, he seems to be quite, quite a good teacher. You know? Because we are doubtful. We are not really sure because you know, all these spiritual teachers pass through town and they teach different things. And we do not really know what to do. We are doubtful. Now there is one thing that all these different teachers had in common. They were teaching different things, yes, but they had one thing in common. And they taught the people their own doctrines, promoting and praising their own doctrines, and tearing down the views of their opponents. Meaning, I'm the one who knows the truth. Drop all the others, follow me. <laughs> and the Buddha doesn't do that. The only one who doesn't do that. It's quite interesting. It doesn't say, Drop the others, follow me, nonsense with the other. No, it's really. He actually says, I'm quoting here, huh? it's fitting for you to be perplexed, addressing the Kalamans. It's fitting for you to be in doubt. Doubt has arisen about a perplexing matter. So it's good to be doubtful. It's not a problem. And then he said to the Kalama, do not go by oral tradition, what's been passed down through one generation of teachers to another. Don't depend upon a lineage of the teaching, by hearsay, by a collection of texts, by logic and inferential reasoning. Don't believe a teacher just because he's very elegant, eloquent and very impressive. And don't even believe somebody just because you think that he is your teacher. So, be doubtful. <laughs> it's good to be doubtful. <laughs> mm. And then he follows. The Buddha then says, you know, When you know for yourselves these things are unwholesome. These things are blamable. These things are blamed by the wise. These things followed up lead to harm and suffering. Then you should abandon them. And then he used a common sense way of questioning, it's typical of the Buddha. So he asked the Kalama, what do you think? when greed, hatred, and delusion arise in you. Hmm. Does it lead to your welfare or to your harm? There were 
the Kalamas were quite intelligent. They said, no, it will lead to my own harm. You know. As I was saying in the other class, you know, if we were to ask this question today in the world outside there, maybe we would get a different answer. You know, if, uh, they heard me, oh, tooth for tooth. <laughs> Kill them all. <laughs> That's the way to go. <laughs> very laughable, but very true and very common. Doesn't work. <laughs> Doesn't work. Anyway, I'm digressing. They said it leads to harm. Then the Buddha said, a person who was greedy, hated, hating and deluded, overpowered by greed, hatred and delusion, motivated by these mental forces, will destroy life, steal the belongings of others, commit sexual misconduct, speak lies, and will also persuade others to act in the same way. Huh. So, will that lead to his harm and suffering for a long time? And the answer is yes, of course. And then the opposite, of course, as typical of the teaching of the Buddha. Then the Buddha speaks about a person who, uh, who was without greed, without hatred, without delusion. So when the mind is free from greed, hatred and delusion, does it lead to one's well-being or to one's arm? It leads to one's well-being, of course. Mm. And the person without greed, hatred and delusion will avoid taking life, stealing, sexual misconduct and false speech, and persuade others to do likewise, and that will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. Hmm? So we see from this sutta that the Buddha is instructing these people to see for themselves, to verify for themselves, not to believe him or anybody else, but to be responsible. Hmm? It's really interesting to me. Hmm? And in a way this is the essence of the Buddha's teaching. To overcome and to eliminate greed, hatred and delusion. Hmm? The three poisons. These are what the Buddha calls the, uh, the three unwholesome roots. They are the roots of all the other disturbing and distressing mental states. Hmm? All arise and are rooted in greed, hatred and delusion. They are the underlying motives for all types of unso all unwholesome action. And so, the ultimate aid of the Buddha's teaching is to overcome and actually to eradicate and eliminate greed, hatred and delusions. Delusion, sorry. As we all know, um, we have to see and verify for ourselves what is actually greed, what is actually hatred, and what is actually delusion. Now, about greed, I find this very interesting. You know. Usually we have this idea of you know, being greedy, you know, attached to things, you know, it's... Uh, I mean, it's all that, of course, but actually what is implied, or not really implied, but you know, thought as greed, is we could define it as a very ancient habit in the mind, to seek pleasure and satisfaction in sensual stimuli or objects. That's basically great for the Buddha. We are really convinced that by seeking satisfaction through the senses, we will be at peace. Unfortunately, it's a never-ending story. 
because one after the other, one after the other. You are never really totally satisfied. You know? That's the idea of dukkha. You know? It's you are ne- never really really satisfied. You know, it's there is always something not quite right. <laughs> a sort of a basic distaste or something around those lines. Just something not really fitting. <laughs> no, as much as we try, you know, it's uh, because things change. That's the Dhamma. Every conditioned phenomena changes, is impermanent. The only unchanging is of course Nibbana. The unconditioned is not conditioned. (laughs) So that's where we seek through refuge. But of course, first of all in the Dhamma. And by seeing deeply, very many times into the Dhamma, we realize freedom from suffering. That's the gist of it, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, just really seeing, not in a conceptual way, of course, you know. These, these are not concepts, these are realities, you know. It's just, oh, yes, it's, it's, it's really real, like, who would have thought? Like, conditioned phenomena change all the time. Wow. <laughs> so, why get attached? No use. <laughs> totally useless. <laughs> It'll change anyway. <laughs> it's, why do you build this something out of nothing? <laughs> Basically. You know? But of course, we already know these things from an intellectual point of view. It's not such a big mystery. We didn't need to wait for the Buddha to tell us these things. You know. Things change. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> As if I didn't know about that. <laughs> It's not really just that, you know, it's because you are not seeing clearly into that, that you have certain behaviors, which are basically the three poisons, greed, anger and delusion, which basically cloud the mind and make you act in a very unwholesome way, hmm? producing basically suffering for yourself and others. So, it's, uh, so that's why it's called Vipassana, or Satipattana Vipassana, seeing repeatedly, very many times, in depth. What? The Dhamma, of course. <laughs> the way things really are. That's just about it. You know? It's uh, not so complicated. Not easy, though. Huh? It's, uh, hmm. Then we have another sutta which very briefly I may tell you about is a conversation, com- I mean it's dialogue, a conversation that the young Brahmin was having with the Buddha. Hmm? And this young Brahmin, being a young Brahmin, was challenging the Buddha, you know, trying to trap him in a way. But But then the Buddha replied to this young Brahmin until the young Brahmin became interested in the teaching of the Buddha and asked him, okay, teach me. (laughs) It's really funny. And the question he asked the Buddha was, actually, how does the discovery of truth take place? How? How do you do it? That's that's a very direct question. How do you do it? Uh, okay, there is a truth. By seeing this truth, I become liberated. How do you do that? It's, uh, and this is a really important aspect of the teaching of the Buddha, you know, because it is a very different way from the usual way, hmm? and. Um,
because this liberation doesn't come simply from believing the Buddha and accepting the Buddha as the, the enlightened one but the truth is something that one has to realize for oneself hmm. how do you do it? okay we have a few points this is the reply of the Buddha one first a yogi or a seeker should go to somebody who is reputed as to be a teacher and investigate the, that teacher observe him his behavior how he talks does he really walk the talk <laughs> that's the idea that's one number one okay you need a teacher go find a teacher and don't just accept him but watch him possibly mm. okay two by doing this maybe but usually then this yogi gains faith in that teacher he visits him and pays respect to him three then one listens to that teacher and one listens then one hears the Dhamma the teaching of that teacher and having heard the Dhamma one retains it in mind you will remember it <laughs> and one examines the meaning of the teachings so you actually hear the teaching you remember the teaching and you think about it is this something that makes sense? yes, no, not so convinced but you don't just blindly accept it you know, it's, it's a process actually you know. then one eg when one examines the meaning of the teachings then one is willing to accept those teachings as a result of the examination say, okay makes sense I'm willing to accept this teaching when one accepts the teachings then there arises a desire to realize the truth and when that desire arises then one applies the will this is extremely important you know? having applied the will again one investigates the teaching now at a deeper level what is actually meant by applying the will is actually practicing meditation and developing the insights having done that you again you will re-examine the teaching but from a deeper point of view not just from an intellectual point of view but from a much deeper place you know, which is not conceptual but is based on the insights which you go through in the practice like, oh yes, something around those lines. <laughs> yes, oh yeah, of course. I could have been so stupid for so long. <laughs> so self evident. It's, what an idiot I was. <laughs> years, years, and years of being so stupid. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Eh? <laughs> mm. Having examined the teachings at that level, one strives, and then by striving, this would apply to the development of deep insight meditation. One personally realizes the supreme truths hmm? and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. Penetrating wisdom usually is used, you know, yeah. cuts through. Hmm? In this way, there is the discovery of truth. The truth that the Buddha is teaching is the truth about human existence, particularly the, those truths that will enable us to liberate ourselves from suffering. Meaning, I teach one thing and one thing only, dukkha dukkha niroda. Hmm? All conditions phenomena are impermanent strive on, be a lamp upon yourself those were 
his last words, roughly. You know, so I leave no senior teacher or anything like that. You know, it's I taught you, I gave you the teachings. Remember this: all conditioned things are impermanent. Strive on. <laughs> Be a lamp upon yourself. You know. Be an island upon yourself. It's quite interesting. You know, it's. Uh, quite straightforward and not mysterious in any way. You know? I have shown you the way, now go walk. There is no other way. <laughs> you know? Eh, well, we are always looking for uh, maybe a better way, or <laughs> a quicker way, or... <laughs> maybe I haven't really understood well. <laughs> Another Dhamma talk. I mean, which is understandable, of course. There must be a reason why the Buddha... I mean, he, he talked for 40 plus years after his own enlightenment. So it must have been useful somehow, otherwise he would have kept silent. <laughs> no use in talking, bye-bye. No. no, he actually was talking and teaching for 40 plus years. A long time, very, a really long time. And he was the Buddha. So he must have seen some sort of usefulness to that, I guess. You know? Otherwise he wouldn't have done that. Oh, what bother? You know? So that's the idea. Any questions? Of course not. So clear. <laughs> I mean, crystal clear. Just, just practice. Just go and do the practice. <laughs> and strive on. I mean, I'm, oh, oh, of course, I'm just joking. Huh? It's, uh, if you have any doubts that I might be able to, you know, sometimes languages and it's not easy. Uh, I'm trying to make it as concise as clear as possible. So, there is Buddhism, there is the Buddha, there is the Dhamma, hmm? which is this universal law, which is always there. By realizing the Dhamma in depth, we gain realization or freedom from suffering. Okay? Then we get into the specifics. Okay, how do we do that? <laughs> okay, well and good. How do we actually do that? <laughs> well, you follow the teachings of the Buddha, which is not just meditation, but you need sila or morality, at least a little bit. <laughs> you need the practice, which is not an intellectual practice. Not at all. It's, it's another way. We do not realize these truths by thinking about them. No. Thinking is nice and is useful up a certain point. And then you say, okay, I agree with this. Let's go. <laughs> then you start the practice. Okay? You just get out of your head, out of concepts, hmm? and get closer and closer and closer to ultimate realities, which is, quite frankly, quite down to earth. You're sitting there, your belly goes up and down, okay? Is that a concept? No. Can you feel it? Yes. Good. <laughs> that, that's all. <laughs> Stay with this. Not think about this. Huh? Just feel it. You have to feel it. Oh. You see, we want to use these terms, the elements. Is it soft? Is it hard? Cold? Hot? Does it move? <laughs> Those are the elements. No, it's uh, and then after a while a question usually comes up in the mind I know you've had this question who is watching? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had this funny thought in your mind? <laughs> to a certain point it comes you know, say oh who, who's watching who? Who's watching what? <laughs> I mean, 
my watching something is something watching me? What the hell is going on? <laughs> Again, that's intellectual, you know. That's, uh, just keep going. <laughs> just keep going. <laughs> In a way, you know. But just th- I mean, these are just the basics, but not not uh, just not just the basics. You know, this like this is it. <laughs> you know, just you know, get out of your head, out of concepts. Con- out of conceptual reality, you know, it's uh, get down to the the primary elements, what makes up everything, you know, like this, like, oh, okay, nice. and this is really something that doesn't really come immediately as an attitude, you know, just and just be with it. <laughs> I mean. What do you mean? Just be with it. <laughs> I have to understand how, it's, how does this actually happen? How does it work? I say, oh, no. Just let it be and be with it and watch it. No? <laughs> it's usually, at the beginning, we are not so convinced. It's just what does he actually mean? <laughs> just be with it and watch it. It's, uh, I've been watching this all my life. It's not really. <laughs> You've been watching a concept, not a reality. No? Just thoughts are just thoughts, like sounds. And yet, we think, I have thought that. Oh yes, great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so that can be really in the practice. I think that can be really useful. You know, just you know, consider thoughts. Same thing as sounds. Same value. S- usually, s- we are not so convinced in the beginning. You know, oh, sounds are sounds, but thoughts are thoughts. You know, being thinking. You know, it's just as a big experiment. You know, it's just you know. Try and get back to just this sitting, just this walking, just as a very brief sort of an experiment. Okay, just for this one sitting, I'll just try and see thoughts as noise in the mind. Hmm? And they're not mine. By the way, you can just, you know, play these games like, I haven't thought these thoughts. This is my next one neighbor. They're not mine. <laughs> These. <laughs> or hers. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, seems funny like that, but it's, it's one way to go about it. You know, just, we give so much importance to this. I need an explanation, and the whys, and the hows, and where does this come from, where this will lead me. Of course, nowhere. It's always here now. <laughs> doesn't come from anything. Yeah. Just, this could be useful, you know. In, it comes from the suttas, I guess. Just, just tamas arising and ceasing. Nothing more, nothing less. Dhammas, in this particular context, means conditioned phenomena. Just dhammas arising, just dhammas ceasing. Nothing more, nothing less. Not mine. Just dhammas arising, just dhammas ceasing. That's all. When we remember about that, it's actually helpful. <laughs> But we seem to be f- very forgetful. Usually, we forget. <laughs> you must you know, bring back the mind, bring back the mind uh, to this sort of, you know, it's basic, very basic, you know, sort of way to go about things. You know, just okay, just just dhammas arising and ceasing. I'm not doing anything. Just being, you know, just laid back and watching all this process going on. uh, Don't take it personally. (laughs) 
<laughs> which is possible, by the way. You know, when, when we actually do that, it's, it's much more a sort of a flowing kind of experience. You know, it's when we get blocked into this, I me mine, I me mine, <sighs> really fatiguing and stressful dukkha. That's it for tonight, I would say. Any questions? Okay? Then we can walk for 15 minutes and then come back for the metta. Okay? Thank you for your patience and practice. See you very soon. All of you.